Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th and final webinar in our uh, action series on cultural safety and hum humility. If you haven't already done so, uh, please, we, we do invite you to introduce yourself uh, to us in the chat box. Uh, please tell us who you are and where you're from. Um, for those of you that are on social media, uh, and particularly Twitter, we do encourage you to use the hashtag cultural humility uh, and it starts with me and the Twitter handles at FNHA and at BCPSQC. There's that lovely acronym for the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. Um, so due to the number of participants that we do have on the call today, we are muting lines. Uh, there, there will be ample time for Q&A at the end. Uh, also, if you know, you've got thoughts throughout the event, uh, please do enter those into the chat box uh, and we'll be uh, taking those questions uh, at the end of the event. Um, I'm going to walk us quickly through just a couple of housekeeping slides, uh, but before uh, I do that, I just wanted to sort of uh, welcome everyone properly. So, Ajishwit Tamnans Ajay Mathoat, Tamnans the Tichui Kwakwa Ju Tuama Nation. My name is Davis McKenzie. I'm from the communications team with the FNHA and I'm from Tuama Nation. Uh, we are hosting our event in team today. Uh, on the unceded Coast Salish territories, and we make our home uh, offices here on Squamish Nation land. So I want to begin with that acknowledgement, and, and thanks again to the Squamish Nation for being such gracious hosts uh, to us as we carry out this work. Uh, so welcome to our 11th and final webinar on cultural safety and humility. Uh, our topic today is leading with culture in First Nations community context. Uh, very pleased to host and joined by two very special guests uh, today. Uh, Virginia Peters uh, from Salis, and also our very own uh, Dr. Shannon McDonald. So uh, I'll be introducing those folks in a moment. But first, some housekeeping. Uh, so just a couple of things. If you haven't, if you're not a WebEx expert, uh, and I'm sure many of us aren't actually, uh, take, please do take a look uh, at uh, these slides as we go through them. There's a number of ways that you can actually interact in WebEx. Uh, and if you do take a look at the screen here, you can raise your hand if you've got a question. We have some voting uh, tools. I uh, don't think we have any voting questions today in particular. Uh, we do have the, the chat box as well. So there are a number of uh, tools to interact with us today as we go through the content. Uh, the WebEx audio, very important. We want to know that uh, all the folks on the line uh, right now can hear us. So. Um, do, do check in and uh, take a quick look. You can see on the screen there's a little phone. Um, this enables you to mute, unmute your line uh, and, and promotes more effective uh, discussion. Uh, please do just ensure that all of your lines are, are muted. I know we can do that automatically, um, but, but please do uh, make sure that as we go through the presentation. Um, if you can't hear us, uh, we do have our technical wizard, Sue, uh, also on the line. So please just uh, type in your technical difficulties in the chat box and we will uh, ensure that we uh, connect with you to resolve those on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, chat, we've already got your introduction, so welcome everyone. Uh, important note, we are recording this session. Uh, there is much more interest sort of beyond those that can make uh, today's event, so we will be recording and posting this. Uh, all of the other 10 webinars we've done are also posted on fnha.ca, uh, so browse on over and search out uh, Cultural Humility uh, and you will see this we uh, webinar series. Okay, uh, we will be per uh, emailing out the link. Uh, again, here are the hashtags that we talked about a little bit before and the Twitter handles for those uh, social media mavens. Uh, please do get the conversation going out there. I believe with one of our webinars, we did get to trending on Twitter, so uh, please do uh, take it to Twitter. Um, so really, uh, just a sort of uh, final housekeeping matter is just around the, the subject matter. And uh, this, this slide really is here uh, in relation to some of the uh, previous topics that we had especially that really uh, delved into uh, talking about systemic racism. So um, as, as a matter of course for this series, we want to remind people that uh, if, if any of the uh, points discussed today are, are triggering in any way, uh, help is available and there is a, a toll-free line that you, can, uh, that you can call. All right, so now to the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> to what you've actually tuned in to hear about, um, it, it's really, um, my pleasure to be your host today. Before we turn it over to uh, Virginia, just want to provide some context around this action series. 
uh, this action series was first contempla uh, contemplated, I would say, way back in the spring of 2016 uh, as a learning opportunity and a way for us to collectively share the good work happening across this province uh, to make the health system more safe for First Nations and Aboriginal people. Uh, this work, importantly, uh, builds on some pretty key and large agreements across the province. Uh, the declarations of commitment to cultural safety and humility signed now by all the health authorities, the Ministry of Health, the 23 health regulatory colleges, uh, BC Coroner Service, uh, Providence Health, we, we're, everyone signed on. So there, there's no reason we shouldn't all be doing this work together. Um, I would just say that if you haven't been able to take in the rest of the series and hear from the health authorities and their good work and some of our other partners, I just encourage you to browse over to our website and catch up on those. So let's get to it. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our speakers. First up is uh, Virginia Peters. Many of you will uh, know Virginia. Uh, she is an elder for the First Nations Health Directors Association and has worked in health, First Nations health programming since 1972. Uh, Virginia was the manager of health for Stayless for many, many years. Uh, and Virginia Ginny, uh, known as Auntie Ginny to many of us, uh, is an elder born to William and Nancy Phillips from Chalice, BC. Her immediate family consists of three daughters, two sons, 10 grandchildren, six foster grandchildren, and 19 great grandchildren. She has a large extended family uh, and estimating at over 1,500 people. So <laughs> Virginia's, Virginia's got a big clan. Um, her family is very close-knit and strongly linked. Um, coming from a strong matriarchal system, uh, Ginny's professional life began with several years of volunteering. Uh, she began in community services in the 1960s. Uh, community services she was involved in with the JLS included uh, religion, the church committee, uh, longhouse, youth group, youth native dance group, school board, band, four terms uh, as band counselor, chief one term, uh, social development portfolio for the whole Solo Tribal Council. Uh, these are just a few of Virginia's accomplishments, by the way. There are many, many more. Um, her professional experience started in 1972 and included secretary, bookkeeper, uh, manager of health, social development and family services, uh, coordinating health transfer plans, uh, including the big transfers to Salus, uh, and uh, coordinating special projects and accounting. Uh, being a family and community-oriented person, Ginny continues to dedicate much time and effort to assist community development and healing, and firmly believes culture and spirituality is key to healing and rebuilding the strength of our family and community. So before I turn it over to Virginia for a prayer, I'm gonna also introduce our second speaker, Dr. Shanna McDonald. She's our Deputy uh, Chief Medical Officer with the First Nations Health Authority, uh, and works with regional health authorities and partners to ensure high quality, coordinated, and complementary health services are being offered by organizations and the FNHA to First Nations people in BC. Dr. McDonald reports on population and public health issues that require collaborative and coordinated response and leads communications on issues that re require uh, immediate action. So uh, without further ado, I think we'll uh, now turn it over to uh, Virginia for our words that go before all others properly. Thank you very much. Um, Tilsqui is my traditional name. Um, welcome everyone. I'm going to read um, a prayer in, in our language, um, our Alkamilam language, um, which is one of the things that we lost, you know, through colonization. And some of us um, just are now learning how to um, read and speak the language. So I'm going to do my best, and I'm sure all my great-grandchildren will be able to outdo me any day. Uzi sequi sisia me stiu me qua equala isave telau wheel si tamitet quis me tuk ah quis dark to quis shwe eam tit cas qua e tau mel quisset e asa to Squilla Wilson, Quisu, Quam Quam So, Set Mistil Set. O Great Spirit, bless all the people that come here to enjoy this day. We praise you. Help us. Give us strength and good wisdom. Let our thoughts be pure. 
let our spirits be strong. And we say this in the great um, words of the Creator who put us here to do special things um, for him while we are here, all my relations. Okay, I'm not a technical wizard, so sometimes I need help. Um, I am a guest on this territory and have been for about seven years. I originally come uh, from the Anishinaabe lands in southern Manitoba. Um, and so when I talk about traditional medicine, my experience is different than the experience that all of you may have had and some of you want to have. So I'm really excited to um, support the work at FNHA um, in working with First Nations and traditional healers in lots of different forums and gatherings and meetings as we go forward. And our, the biggest part of our job is listening. So we've had an opportunity to do that. And we'll be reflecting that um, in um, a new document. We have a, the traditional wellness strategic framework and some work coming up um, that supports that. Really looking at building understanding and developing resources and increasing knowledge transfer and partnership uh, around this work and ultimately advocating for and supporting traditional medicine practitioners in community. So what I've been talking about um, is the Keeping the Spirit Alive guidebook and we have been absolutely honored in the number of people that have participated in its development across um, the nations and the communities in BC. Um, and this particular document is intended um, to support health directors and community program planners and others uh, with a collection of wise practices of things that uh, people are doing uh, across BC and in Canada to support the continuation and access to uh, traditional medicines and to work to integrate First Nations healing systems and the wellness approaches um, into health programming for all of our citizens and to support an ongoing dialogue. Um, as uh, Virginia mentioned earlier, some of those pieces have been lost over time um, and it's really important that we sit and talk about how we can approach this um, and what potential solutions may be to communities reviving traditional practices and um, the availability. But we do not at any time in the document prescribe a particular approach to First Nations health and wellness. That's not our work. And nor does it describe specific First Nations healing methods. Those are uh, ways that belong to the communities um, in their methods, practices, and medicines. And it is their story to share in the heart. So in moving forward toward the integration of approaches, we need to understand what we mean by traditional healing and wellness. So I'm going to go over a few definitions or elements of uh, traditional wellness. And these were developed by engagement with elders uh, at the elders gathering last year. And from a significant number of discussions um, that have been had with traditional healers and the First Nations health directors association planning committee. So I acknowledge all of the people who have contributed to this work. So in this slide, traditional wellness is proactively staying well by keeping the spirit alive and centered in the body. In the definition or the element of connection, traditional wellness is knowing who you are what your connection is to family, community, spirit and culture, and the land and the ancestors whose spirits rest there.
traditional wellness is a holistic model um, and includes for what is for us the Anishinaabe people, the four elements of the, the medicine wheel, but other people describe it in different ways. The elements are the same. They are mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual health. And traditional healing and wellness can include a lot of different things. Um, sometimes for me, it's just having my feet on the soil. But it can also include ceremony and prayer. And thank you, Virginia, for starting this out in a good way. Um, traditional medicine and food and gathering to share those medicines and foods. The song, the sacred spaces, the language and the stories that come in those languages. Dance, smudging, brushing, and other cleansing ceremonies like morning dips. <laughs> Hunting and gathering, fasting, running, and we were just talking before we started today about um, preparing food for storage. Um, all of those things are ceremony if they're done uh, with spirit in mind and, and um, with prayer. Traditional healing can also include seeking help from an elder or a traditional healer to heal a broken spirit, an ill body, or just as part of maintaining one's wellness to bring their feet back to the ground and their um, life into balance and to look for guidance. Because sometimes we get a little lost, right? <laughs> Now, uh, when we were preparing this, um, I had a conversation uh, with Krista, who's in the room here, but you don't see her, about the fact that one of the things that I struggle with in dealing with my medical colleagues is their lack of understanding that systems of traditional and medicine um, and healing have been established and have been going on and well-functioning for centuries and millennia that people are chosen early in life and go through a very rigorous training program, not only in terms of the skills they need to provide, but they're keeping their own spirit well. Um, and we recognize some of the Ayurvedic medicine from India or Chinese traditional medicine, but First Nations medicines don't seem to get the same kind of respect. And so there's a real need to um, have conversations about Gee, pharmaceutical companies are producing medicines all the time that are based on our traditional medicines. And that I was telling uh, Krista about knowing that we build our sweat lodges in the prairie out of red willow. And the red willow is the source of acetosilic acid, which most people know as aspirin. So in a steamy environment, in a sweat lodge, that chemical is released and helps relieve pain in a biochemical way but we're also healing our spirit and building community in those environments. So it's much more complicated and layered and historic than many people believe. The other thing that's really important is the accountability to the community of the people who are the practitioners. And I think that's probably one of the strongest elements in that training of, of traditional uh, practitioners is that the community is watching all the time. And there is a strong accountability mechanism. We don't need a college of physicians and surgeons. There's uh, much more local uh, interaction. So in terms of supporting traditional wellness, these are a few of the themes that um, have arisen through engagements with First Nations. Um, and I kind of jump all over the place, but I think um, the understanding has to be that this is culturally led um, and embeds First Nations knowledge, beliefs, and values, and practices as leading approaches in health services. And the world is very curious about what we do and how we do it, and are sometimes surprised by it. 
So one of the fundamental pieces is down at the bottom and it is the handshake. And though traditionally um, an individual who seeks help is often not directly charged for the provision of that service, they have to recognize that people still need to eat, they need to drive their cars and put gas in their cars. Um, and you can't eat a blanket. <laughs> so when we talk about the handshake, it's just the acknowledgement of, of the fiscal needs of individuals and making sure that we are compensating people for their time and effort. In the same way, we need to look, as I said, about the accountability of individuals providing service and the recognition by the community of the skills of those individuals. But we want to make sure that individuals, our, our patients, our, our community members who are accessing the services are safe emotionally, physically, and spiritually as they access. Um, and that we, um, in the litigious world in which we live, we need to make sure that people, um, their liability is covered in the work that they do. Um, and that they have undergone a criminal record check and an abuse registry check so that we're being very cautious about uh, who people are being exposed to. And confidentiality is absolutely uh, essential in the work. Um, we want to make sure that there are codes of conduct under the guides, um, traditional protocols, which can be much stricter than any guidebook I've ever worked by. Um, <laughs> and identification of how one behaves. Um, so looking at scope of practice, because different practitioners have different skills. They may have skills in the medicine or skills in ceremony or um, skills in bringing out the strengths of, of individuals they're working with. We need to know what those are so we're making appropriate referrals. But we want to respect um, community and family knowledge uh, one of the things that I've always really appreciated in attending any kind of ceremony in British Columbia First Nations is the sense of ownership of the songs and the dances and the protocols that happen um, in community. That's not something I had experienced before, but I'm very appreciative of it and want to make sure that those things are not misused, abused, or commercialized in any way. Um, and we don't want colonization to seep in the door uh, as we're doing the work. Um, and we want to respect the intellectual property rights of the families, communities, and, and providers. Um, we want to be able to preserve cultural foods and medicines. Um, the ones that I know from my childhood are very different than the ones here. But I have a strong appreciation of people who know the land and know the medicines and know how to access them. And, what to do with them and how to protect them. Um, so we want to make sure that those cultural foods and medicines um, are available, but people are educated. They know how to harvest properly. They know how to make sure um, that they are sustainable in the environment. They know how to process them and they know how to share them. There are some exceptions that I'm a little nervous about, but <laughs> I'm learning. Um, I was very impressed last week. I was um, on the west coast of Vancouver Island and had the opportunity to meet um, some elders who were in the process of bringing some of the younger members of their communities um, to a retreat with the thought that they're going to be sharing their knowledge and skills with those young people and supporting them in their learning journey, recognizing that they're not going to be around forever um, and the need to make sure that those um, ceremonies and skills are passed on from generation to generation. Um, and they are, they hold themselves responsible for finding the right people in community and identifying who they are. Um, it helps us when we need to be able to access elders and healers in the community or for a patient who might be uh, seeking those services. Um, so we need to know what people need and then be able to seek uh, individuals with those skills and talents um, who are recognized in their community um, for being able to provide the service. We want to make sure that the teachings are revitalized and the stories that come with those healing ceremonies and wellness activities um, are also available to people. Um, 
And finally, uh, looking at mentoring um, people in their learning and supporting them in their learning because it's not always easy to be involved in someone's healing. So, um, healthcare providers, my colleagues and friends who sometimes think, you want to do what? With who? Why? Um, and I think it's really, really important to have open conversations with patients when they're well or when they're ill and asking them, what does success look like for you? What does wellness look like for you? And what do you need to get there? How can we work together? And to be open to individuals who describe things that you may not understand, uh, ceremonies or connections uh, to their culture or their land, um, and be supportive. Don't dismiss it. Um, learn more about it if you don't understand, um, because people are often defensive of, of what we know um, and say, well, no, the medicine I'm giving you is more important. Don't don't go and do that, where in actuality, most of the traditional providers I know, if you have a conversation with them and ask about how you can work together, you'd find something um, very different. Um, it, it is really the patient's healthcare journey, and it's our job as practitioners, both on the traditional side and on the Western medicine side, to assist people in moving forward on that journey. Um, and that collaboration with traditional practitioners who may be a part of the individual's life and, and healing journey um, is really the best way to get there. And to take every opportunity to learn and to listen. Listening is such a huge part of the learning process. And we're not always patient. You know, everybody's in a big hurry. Got to go to rounds. Got to say what I got to say in about three seconds, and I have another patient waiting at the store. It is really, really important to take a moment to truly listen to what a patient, their family, and their community are telling you um, so that you can fully support their journey. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. And now the really important person <laughs> is going to talk to you, Virginia. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, just listening to um, what Shannon um, just shared with all of us, you know, um, I can really appreciate um, the technical help, you know, that we are getting um, in order for us to really work at um, bringing back a lot of the um, the teachings or the ways um, um, to help ourselves um, back to life again. It's not an easy process, and um, I know um, we don't usually write things, um, you know, the teachings from our elders were never written down. You know, we were told over and over. Um, but in this day and age, you know, um, this uh, modern world that we're living in now, um, and the losses that we incurred, um, we really need to um, work together. Um, and writing all of this down is really going to help, I think, in the revival, because um, for some people, um, it can be very difficult. So cultural safety and cultural humility, um, you know, um, a few of our elders, um, they were um, really stingy. <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for for teaching us or letting us know, um, you know, how they really did things, what our beliefs were and what our values were, and um, how we can really practice them and live them. Um, but they said, you, you know, um, it's time, and this was a few years ago, maybe five years ago or eight years ago, they said it's time for us to share. We can't be stingy anymore. Um, we need to um, let the people know um, our ways. We need to create a, a better understanding. Uh, and the only way we can do that is 
to let them know and let them and expose it to them also because um, you can't really um, um, gain um, a strong understanding of our ways and the way we do things is um, um, by reading it or by just hearing it here. You know, it's something that um, really needs some, we need it to be experiential. You know, if we're going to be giving a teaching, you know, you, um, getting it in a classroom is not going to be as meaningful as um, going to a longhouse or, you know, one of our own traditional settings. So in the aim is, um, you know, we, um, we really put into practice um, a lot of, um, a lot of those ways and it, um, it took courage um, and, um, you know, a lot of effort and, and um, strength to, to go through it. So, I have only a certain amount of time here today, you know, and I could talk on and on if um, uh, if I'm, I was given a chance to speak, but I only have a little bit of time, so I'm, I wrote down a few things on, on how we do things um, in Staelis and how uh, we were able to um, revive a lot of our ways. So Staelis is one of the first um, nation's communities in the Stalo um, region and that were all situated um, along the um, Fraser River. And Stalis um, is about um, 27 miles or kilometers of, um, east of um, Mission. So just to give you an idea of where we're located. Now our population is um, our total population is 1170 around there and uh, we have about 560 who are living on reserve. We are semi-isolated and surrounded by the Chehalis River and the Harrison River. We consider ourselves to be very rich, being protected by all of the natural resources the mountains, the trees, and the water. And from those, you know, we get um, what health provides you to us, the fish, the one that fly, the four-legged, and the one that crawl. Our ancestors thrived on these um, riches. They had strong survival skills and lived a lifestyle that was strong spiritually and culturally. They had a sound um, value system. And their systems, you know, um, were to pass that on to the next generations. Um, they cannot, um, this is something, this is who we are, this is something we, we need to carry on in order for us to stay living in, in a really good way. And like many other indigenous communities, um, you know, the illness suffered severely and when colonized, when colonization came upon us. Um, when we lost, um, we lost our culture, our spirituality, our language, and it was really devastating. Our future, meaning our children, being taken away. What do we do? And where is hope? Our lives then became meaningless. Our confidence and our esteem were destroyed. Then fortunately, um, we are we were very resilient. The great creator of hells um, did not allow our culture and spirituality to be completely lost. In 1969, the spirit began making its way back to, to Staelis 
and it started with the winter spiritual dancing. Three of our members um, were initiated into the to the spiritual dancing. One went to Lake Honor and um, two went to Seabird Island because we really didn't have any more longhouses um, in our community. You know, those were all taken away. Um, everything was taken away from us. You know, the drums and um, all the uh, ceremonial regalia, um, everything um, was taken away. Uh, and uh, we only had a handful of people left who still um, practiced um, the spiritual dancing, but they weren't willing to um, teach us about it. Uh, they were afraid um, if they exposed it that it would be taken away too. Uh, and um, so they were stingy for it. I mean, we got to hang on to it. So we couldn't get any information from them, so um, we had to go to a few um, other communities like Capilano and uh, Muscreen who still were practicing. And like we mentioned, La Connor and um, Lummi over on the state side. So in 1971, um, uh, one at uh, entered the spiritual um, winter dancing in an old house in our community. You know, the, the spirit um, chooses people, and um, and it, it wasn't fully recognized and, and didn't know how to deal with it. And so we, that's when we came to Musqueam and Catalano and, and got some teachings, and they were the ones who came and helped us at that time. We didn't have a place, we didn't have a longhouse, so um, a few of the older ones um, um, tore the walls down in the old house, <laughs> and, and that was used um, for the initiation. But now, you know, since that started, we have four longhouses in our community, and um, we have a mini longhouse um, that um, we use for teaching and it um, was um, built um, to help with our Children Family Services Program. So, so we now have the four houses and we gather um, thousands of people um, during um, the winter dancing season. So that begins um, like in October and goes until March. So we have, you know, those months that we can practice these, and, and um, a lot of um, young people um, volunteer um, to be a spiritual dancer because it's um, it's a way for them to to start anew. Um, so it, it gives us a second chance in life, uh, and so um, it gives them that strength. And the, the foundation, you know, to carry on life in a whole better way. You know, they're tired of um, the way they've been living and, and want to do something about it. So that's one of our ways um, that we have, you know, for them to get their spirit back and to have the strength to be able to walk in a really good way. And, of course, you know, like anything else, it's like a self-help group. Uh, and you only get out of it what you put into it. And so they really have to be committed and be able to carry themselves in the way um, they're taught to carry themselves. Um, in the mid-1980s, uh, we, be we began teaching, or 1970s, we began teaching the Hakamingan language in our school. And so we had a few elders who came into the school and they started teaching our language, uh, the health commitment language, and then the drumming and singing. And a lot of the kids um, were still kind of um, fearful of it uh, because um, a lot of our parents still, um, you know, very ignorant about it because we weren't 
shown um, are ways, um, but it gradually caught on, and um, and today, you know, um, we continue to teach a language, um, right from preschool to grade 12, and uh, we're so fortunate to be able to do that. Like I said, you know, my great grandchildren can speak the language a lot easier than I can. They just learn it so quickly. Yeah, and and they're not afraid to um, get out there and dance, or or to get out there with a the drum or the the clappers. You know, and they they feel so good about it. It's really something to see. You know, when we were so ashamed of it. You know, I remember being, um, you know, eight years old or something, you know, and walking to school. Mom would put braids in my hair. And um, before I got to school, I would have the braids out. You know, it, it was shameful because of all of the um, stigma of, about you know, who we were. Yeah. So in, in the early 80s, um, we started um, to blend um, uh, the drumming, uh, the singing, and um, smudge, and into the church. Um, the priest then became, um, he went along with, with them, allowing it to happen. We had a difficult time with some of our elders because there were such strict teachings um, from the residential school, you know, that um, those are not to be brought in the church. You know, it's something that we put behind us. Um, but um, gradually um, that um, was allowed, and, you know, we had priests um, coming in who um, accepted that. And so, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, we go in a longhouse. The, if the church is too small for a funeral, we have the funerals in the longhouse. Or we have weddings in there and baptisms, and you name it. Um, and so they're much more acceptable of that now. And they are um, really wanting to, at least in Chihamas, you know, they want to um, start singing um, the health mailing hymns as well. Mm -hmm. And um, they teach that in the school. So, you know, we're we're looking forward to that happening with our church group too. So. <clears throat> and um, that revival um, really opened um, um, the door. And, um, you know, the revival became really strong for culture and spirituality and um, our traditional ways. So um, since health transfer um, in Stalus in 1999, um, the Stalus organization um, threads um, all the culture and spirituality into our programs and services. Um, we developed a cultural committee um, comprised of um, members from each of the um, departments so that um, it could be spread throughout the organization and then could be spread out to the families and spread out to the community. So that's the way we um, organized it um, to really put into action, you know, some of our ways. And uh, <clears throat> we do so many things now, you know, that um, that really help um, the foundation um, of um, of the illness um, and and um, the work that we're doing in managing our own programs. So, quick of help is um, a minimum um, security. It's a um, it's a the um, village um, up the hill from us and at the minimum institution. And so um, they are um, partnering with us to um, ensure, you know, that um, they're doing the right things um, 
Uh, we have the right protocols, you know, and, and they really want to bring that back to the inmates um, that are um, in that institute as well. So they partnered with us and they do cultural things with us and we do cultural things with them. So it, um, it really helps, um, helps the, the ones that are in there, but also the staff um, to learn, you know, how they can better reach um, those people. Yeah. So some of our um, ceremonies um, include um, the spiritual burnings. So we do um, two burnings a year, um, one in the spring and one in the fall. And, and that's for the whole community. So our organization does that. Um, and it's um, because all families still don't um, practice that. We want to make sure our loved ones on the other side are, are taken care of in a really good way. So, and we also, um, whenever we develop um, anything as a division or we're going to build a store or a community hall, we make sure that uh, we have a ground blessing so that um, we're not disturbing the ancestors who used to be there before. We're not forgetting about I mean, and we're asking them forgiveness, you know, before we develop anything on the land where they used to, used to live. We do traditional um, naming also, um, and not only um, for uh, the people, but also for all of our um, buildings and um, offices and, um, and the lands. Um, in um, reclaiming, you know, the land um, where our ancestors used to live. So we go back to those places and we um, do ceremony there and um, get connected to the, our um, spiritual um, ancestors. So um, then, you know, we can, we really feel that kind of connection um, help things to blossom or develop, you know, and we can get established um, um, something like waters or whatever, you know. Um, and we even have the designated some land uh, because um, in all of them, you know, the production of today, the logging, for example, um, they were finding a lot of our, um, our sacred objects um, and wondering what to do about them. And um, we, we know that once we put these things away, you know, that it's going to be safe and nobody's going to um, touch them. So um, they were um, successful in um, putting aside um, a part of a mountain um, where um, we, it was designated only for us and for us to have a place to bring all of our sacred things to, you know, once they weren't needed anymore. Yeah. So um, it was such a sad thing, you know, when all of those things were burnt before, you know, taken away from us. And so um, it's um, something, you know, really close to our hearts, you know, to look after that was in a really good way. Um, we have a program called Talmud Altuk, and that means a healing house. Um, and um, so um, the services that we provide there, it was once um, a residential um, treatment program. Um, but since the NADAP review, it's been um, changed to um, a day treatment program. But we're still having a lot of success with that. And they're, they're doing things in that program that really attaches um, the, the ones who are coming for healing to their spirits. So they can go for their cold water baths. They can go in the mountains for, um, for meditation. Uh, they can go out and it can use and, and uh, you know, they're just so much you know, the healing circles uh, that can be done there. The sweat lodges, you know, we um, have a sweat lodge there as well. So. 
and the people come from all over um, the Fraser Valley now as a day treatment program, so we have them transported in and back home um, at the end of the day. So. We also have um, a canoe, like I said, going out in the water is very healing. Um, we built um, an ordinary canoe, yeah, and we call that Cecila, it's a grandma. <laughs> yeah, and um, if you go out in the water, you know, um, there's so much, um, you know, you can get from it. They, they, they get to see um, all of the um, artifacts. The um, pictographs, um, something they seen, you know, and our people were here thousands of years ago, and how they were able to survive, and you know, and how much um, um, our spiritual life can really um, help us out in our life, because these are struggling people, you know. And we took a group out there, we called it a circle of care, um, who um, were grieving, you know, after a loss of a loved one, and they just really had a difficult time getting through um, the loss. And so we took them on that journey, and uh, we stayed with them in the long run for a while, so that they um, are able to um, get enough strength to be able to accept, you know, the loss that they incurred. You know, so these are just some of the things, you know, can uh, really help our people out. Yeah, and some get to the point where um, they just can't function anymore. Yeah, and, and they, um, their mentality can really go down, you know, with the de depression, you know. And, uh, so it's um, this way. The connectedness, you know, and we heard Shannon talking about connectedness. We we firmly believe that if we're connected to our spirit, then we can achieve um, um, healing. So, and so, with, and um, along with um, mental health, um, we developed this the Ailes Wellness Model. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, we can't do things alone. You know, we have to be connected to many others um, in order for us to provide the, the type of care our person needs. And so um, we need to um, ensure, you know, that we know all of the agencies and all the resources around us and so that, that um, and have the proper protocol um, so that, um, you know, we know what they're doing, they know what we're doing. Um, and so it's all um, blended together, yeah. And the, the Snow White program is a children and family services program. And um, we started out with um, having, we said, you know, um, why take the children away yeah, um, from the parents? Like I said earlier, then the, the losses and, you know, um, so what we've done is, is um, Set up um, Salala, which is, means the house. And we bring the whole family in for healing so that they can learn to parent um, the proper way. They can be a functional family, you know, and they can be part of um, all of the good things that are going on instead of being drawn to the negative. So they're given tools that they can use in some of our ways, you know, and we blend all of that together so that they can gain the strength and to be a really um, functioning family instead of having the kids taken away. Yeah. yeah and so, in, like I mentioned, we, we built the mini longhouse um, right beside um, Snow White. The, Snowite me is a big word in our language um, because it means the teachings. And, um, you know, when it's um, the truth, and the honesty, openness. Um, and so we, we operate in that way. And so um, when we have group, we have a women's group, men's group. Um, 
with school, school kids come over, we do some teachings in that many longhouse so that um, they remember who they are. And it's very, very important that um, we retain our identity and have that connection um, to the land. And it's just, um, yeah, just um, has so much meaning. I guess we're getting close to the end, but there, there is so much. That just gives you an example of some of the things that um, we can really um, incorporate into all of the programs and services we do in our communities. And, um, you know, we just really look forward to um, that spreading around. We know there's a few other communities that are practicing their own ways um, and um, bring into life our culture and our spirituality, and we know um, that's how our version one, you know, is really working towards um, making a, making it so that um, many more communities are going to be able to do the same. All my relations. Uh, thank you, both of you, for your uh, presentations. Uh, thank you so much. We have a. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions, uh, not much, um, but I, I think really uh, important to sort of go through the balance of those stories and uh, just thanking you both for uh, your contributions. And, and I think um, what we'll do now is, is just take a few minutes. Uh, if you've got a question, please feel free to type it into the chat box. Uh, otherwise, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute your line and, uh, and take those questions directly. So uh, thank you again, uh, Virginia and, and Dr. Shannon, and let's see what we've, we've got cooking here from, from folks. Wonderful. So uh, a ton of uh, great feedback, um, much gratitude, very informative today. Thank you for the opportunity to learn uh, from Liz and Victoria. Uh, Virginia and Dr. McDonald, we're so grateful for the opportunity to learn from both of you. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, I could listen to Virginia talk for days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Virginia and Shannon, so much for sharing Snow Ias with us. Mm. So uh, any questions at this time, or do you have questions for one another? Other folks in the room, we've got a support team here. Just going to see if we've got any hands up. Great. So I think with that, we'll uh, we'll close out uh, the session. Uh, thank you both again so much, uh, and. Thank you to the BC Patient Safety Quality Council for being such an excellent partner in this work. Um, it's always sort of sad to end something off. Um, it's been a really great 11-part uh, series, and uh, we really look forward to, uh, to working together more in the future to advance cultural safety across the whole uh, healthcare system. So uh, thank you so much to both of you. Chacha Havana, Pech, Imot.